Okay, thank you very much. So I, I don't have too many slides. There's too much to talk about, but hopefully you all have some good questions. So um, I think we'll have a good a good time for asking questions so that we can talk about whatever you all are interested in. So um, the context is we've we've been working on a MIPS processor, like Jeremy said, and um, we're very close to open sourcing it. We're just getting the details with of the license and things sorted out, and we were really trying to get that out in the next month before we have it. We do another presentation um, about it, and then it will be available. So we're we're calling it a Blue Spec Extensible Risk Implementation, or Barry. Um, Go on. So, this is, I've been working on the core, the core of um, Barry, and it's a 64 bit MIPS processor compatible roughly with R4000, so that's going back um, a little more than 20 years um, with the, you know, the open risk went the direction of having a completely clean new ISA. Um, but of course, if you're concerned about patents, you can go back a certain amount of time and, and also produce open implementations, hopefully. So, so um, MIPS was one of the first architectures to have a 64-bit architecture. And our, um, our particular research benefited a lot from having a 64-bit architecture. And it's difficult, because we're doing research, it's difficult to uh, publish research that only applies in a 32-bit address space today when commercial architectures are 64-bit, unless you're talking about something that's embedded. And um, we wanted to be able to uh, have something to say about, about whole um, modern stacks of operating systems. So um, we've got, currently it's a six-stage in-order pipeline. It's got full system support um, that matching roughly the R4000, so it's got the TLB according to the spec and all of the um, system registers according to the spec as best we can. So it, it runs FreeBSD, basically unmodified. We developed some drivers for our system on chip, which I'm sure you all are familiar with that process, but we've got some um, peripherals like a display controller and things like that. I can show you all our, our board later. It's got a t touch screen and all. Um, then we've, we've also added, or I've added a debug unit that is, is roughly, a, it's a, well it's a custom debug unit that we're hoping we'll be able to run um, the GCC, the GBB in, in the future, but that kind of got derailed. But it also has rich execution tracing like, like you were saying, what should we do? Okay. Stefan? Like Stefan was saying, so we have, um, we put out a 256-bit instruction report for every instruction that commits, including what register, what the instruction was that it ran, and what register, what value it wrote to its destination register, and what destination register it wrote, um, and what a memory address it read, read or wrote. Anyway, this is enough to give you a full instruction stream out of the hardware. And you also have filtering for that, so you can choose, I only want to see the instructions that write to a particular address, or that write memory, or something like that. Then we also have an FPU. This is a recent development. We had a, um, a part two student, that's a third year student project, to add an FPU to Barry, and he did a good job, and he's um, helped in the summer and cleaned it up. Uh, it, we've got it to run floating point instructions under FreeBSD. We haven't test, tested extensively under FreeBSD, but it has a lot of tests, unit tests, and we believe it. Um, implements the, the full range of 64-bit um, MIPS FPU, including paired single, so it does a little bit of vector um, instructions too. The only problem we're aware of with it right now is if you let the processor run overnight with the FPU in, even without using the FPU, it's locked up by the morning, so <laughs> we have to do a little more investigation to see what's some rare bug in there. Um, a little bit more, we've got uh, renaming register files, so um, it has either, well, you can choose how many rename registers you want. The current implementation I've got is eight. Um, and even though it's an in-order pipeline, you wouldn't normally have register renaming, but because we uh, wanted to 
make the pipeline extremely simple to extend and allow arbitrary buffering in the pipeline. The simplest way to do dependency resolution is um, just to have um, register renaming, which really is just every instruction that comes in the pipeline is allocated a register for its destination register to hold a temporary value before that has not yet been written back into the main register file. And so this, because we have this, this kind of engine in, we'll look at it a little bit more in a minute, um, it allows you to add an arbitrary buffering in any of the stages that have any number of instructions in flight that you want um, while still having correct dependency resolution. Normally you would have, you would forward values directly from the output of each stage of the pipeline, which um, takes a lot of manual checking for, for any new architectural feature. It's something you would use for a low level um, implementation that you intended to have low power and sell. But we're, this is a research implementation that we want it to be easily extensible. Um, you can try new ideas, try new things, and very quickly get it get it working in hardware. Then the branch prediction, we have a, a moderately sophisticated branch predictor with um, VRAM history and target table. I mean, you can you can have any size you want, but because it's in VRAM, but I think right right now it's something like 4,000 entries. And then we also have call stack prediction, so it, it detects when you have a branch and link, and um, when you're linking into the arc, the normal branch link register, um, and it puts that in a special stack so that when you re return, normally those returns are very unpredictable because you can return all sorts of different locations from, you, you can call the same print function, for example, from lots of different places, so the return is, is very unpredictable. But if you use the call stack op, um, optimization in the branch predictor, you can say, okay, well, we're going to return to the last place that we called from, you know, which turns out to be good. Anyway, so this branch, both the register file and the branch predictor I'm proud of because they have very generic interfaces. So the, the goal is, that you could have 10 different implementations of the branch predictor, some very sophisticated and expensive, some extremely simple and low cost, but all just by choosing which one you instantiate, you can swap them out very easily and get um, different mixes, different implementations, and do studies on the performance benefits of each one. Same thing with the register file now. I've only recently um, pulled that out of the pipeline, so it now has a very clean interface for the main pipeline and this would allow experimentation. I'm hoping in the, this next group of students that comes in and does a course, I'm hoping their projects can be to try to minimize these for the micro version of Barry. So we have a micro uh, version that doesn't have the L2 cache, that doesn't have uh, other bits that we try to make as small as possible. And um, that hasn't had enough attention yet, so I'm hoping we can make versions of these components that are, that are really small. Um, so, okay, we also have a large TLB. The standard MIPS defines a fully associative page table, but this is a little bit heavy for, um, for an FPGA implementation, so where VRAMs are, are very, block RAMs are extremely cheap. So, well, Stefan said that memory was constrained, but we feel like we have tons of memory and the logic is constrained. So, uh, we have 16 fully associative variable page size entries, which is according to the normal MIPS spec. Then on top of that, we have a block RAM with direct mapped four kilobyte entries that can be as big as you want. Currently, it's 128. And each one of these entries for MIPS it has a pair of pages. So um, I guess I can do the math to see how many So it's basically 144, um, is that right? 144 entry TLB that we have in right now, and there's a, um, a TLB cache for the instruction interface and data interface where each, each one currently, this is also changeable with a synthesis, just change a constant, but each one has four um, direct mapped cached pages. So there's a single lookup for this large TLB, and then the, when um, the result is cached, at the instruction and data interface. So you get full pipeline throughput as long as you're using one of the last four pages that didn't alias. Then um, the caches are all 
we have L1 and L2 caches, two L1 caches, one instruction, one data, and then the L2 cache. Um, all of these are 32-byte lines, 256-bit lines, and interfaces and direct maps. So, in other words, the interfaces are quite simple. They, they have a, a full 256-bit wide interface, and it fills an entire line in a single write. So this makes the logic much simpler. Of course, it's larger than you would like, and it would be nice to be more flexible. I had gone to a 64-bit interface and filling the line more slowly, but the, um, there was a noticeable performance decrease um, from, for example, when you had an instruction uh, fetch. Actually, actually, the instruction cache it has is it just still has a 256 bit interface, but the internal structure is 64 bit. But at any rate, um, there was a noticeable hit from um, having to fill from the L2. So the L2 took would take four cycles to fill. So if you missed on the instruction and the data, you would have to wait quite a while before both of them finished, which maybe is something everybody deals with. But having a really big FPGA seemed like a shame if you had to wait for that. Um, but it also made the, makes the structure much easier because you have a single transaction. It brings in the 256, it writes it, and you're done. And in the interest of having an easily extendable architecture and uh, something that's easy to understand, we just went for that. Our L1 caches are 16 kilobytes currently each. Virtually indexed and physically tagged so we can begin the TLD lookup while we start the cache lookup. And then the L2 cache is 64 kilobytes currently. We have lots of um, block RAM. So our main worry about increasing these is not just not being wasteful, but also uh, possibly frequency if you have very, very large um, arrays of block RAMs chained together. Okay. Here's the pipeline in general. We can come back to this in a minute if anyone has a question, but I don't know that it's vastly different than other pipelines. So there's these interfaces are all FIFO interfaces. In fact, um, each stage of the pipeline um, has a FIFO interface for the control token. There's a single control token that goes through the entire pipeline. So um, obviously some fields are only assigned in certain sta stages, but this makes it much easier to modify because, for example, if you suddenly realize, I'd really like to set a flag in instruction fetch and then check it, and write that, right, you know, to see if the instruction fetch maybe hit a ROM or I don't know, something. You can just go to that that um, structure, the control token structure, and say, hit ROM, and you'll know that that's being propagated all the way through the pipeline, and you can assign it right here, and just pick it up and write back, and know, know that it's gone all, all the way through the pipeline and been carried from the FIFO interface to FIFO interface. So. These um, FIFO interfaces, it looks like every one of these stages is just a FIFO for control tokens. But actually, on the NQ interface of each stage, the, all the logic for that stage of the pipeline happens. So when you control, enqueue a, a FIFO to execute, if it allows you to enqueue it, it will do the entire execute for the control token, put the result in the control token, and uh, enqueue that into an output FIFO that gets uh, dequeued and enqueued into memory access. So this is all designed to be very extensible, very modifiable. Um, John, can I just ask a very basic yeah, question? Absolutely. The original MIPS idea was that there were no interlocks between pipeline stages. That's what MIPS stands for. Um, That's but true. by R4000, have that gone? Or is this not, or does the R4000, because I mean, you've got interlocks there effectively, because you've got passing the control token now. Um, is that, a, is that a divergence from R4000 or the MIPS 4000 ditch that anyway? That's a, that's a good question. I need to go back and find out exactly what they mean by not having interlocks. Because once you yeah, get they a certain... They did that pretty early. Yeah. They just kept the name. But it kept us compiler writers in a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, there were two explicit interlocks. One was that the branch slot was always executed. And the other was that a load of memory to a register didn't dirty or change that register until the second afterwards. And the co-generators had to know about that. I, I've written ISSs for R4000 and I put flags in so those things can be either turned on or off. I don't know which one you've done. We've, we definitely have branch delay slots. That's 
been helpful to us. Yeah, but I think it's the load and it's the load to this. Yeah, that that they ditched pretty early. Yeah, we don't we don't do the load delay slot. So if you if you do a load the the um, register file, you notify the register file as soon as you've got your instruction that you're going to have a pending result. In other words, you're not going to have the result and execute. And then it will the pipeline will block. And if there's a dependency on that value, the pipeline will block until it it's been written back. So, um, okay, so here's a layout that I did of um, Barry with the floating point unit just this week, too. So I think I have something to show you guys. Gives you a rough feel for utilization. I think floating point can be quite a bit smaller, but other than that, um, the, it's only been done recently and there hasn't been a huge amount of effort, well, hasn't been much effort in optimizing it. And the reason he was able to do it is because he was using other, he just did, did all the control logic as best he could and used um, other libraries. Originally, he just used hardware libraries from uh, Teresic. No, not from Teresic, from uh, oh, people I use. Um, this uh, new background. Altera, yes. From Altera that makes the FPGAs that we use. Um, but in the meantime, BlueSpec, who, who makes the HDL that we're using, came out with their own libraries, but it turns out the libraries are um, not ideal for large, for 64 bits multiply. So they, anyway, we can, I think we can reduce that. But anyway, basically, um, without the FPU, you can fit four cherry or four berry implementations on one of these FPGAs, which are pretty good size, 230,000 lookup tables. Um, I think, from having worked on it a little bit, that we're within 2x of um, optimal clock speed that we could get. It runs at around, well, consistently you could get 125 megahertz with Barry. Um, and I think it's about within 2x of area. I'm not sure about that. Maybe someone who's a wizard could get it smaller. But for the, for the performance that we have, um, and 64-bit and, uh, and supporting the full ISA, <coughs> it seems to be a bit expensive. We have a, another complete re-implementation also in BlueSpec, and it's very close to the same area utilization. You mean to also get the instructions per clock? Well, the ins instructions per clock in booting FreeBSD, at least the early boot, average at about 1.4. Oh, sorry, cycles per instruction. Sorry, about 1.4 cycles per instruction. Um, in simple loops, it gets very, very close to one cycle per instruction. So for a single issue in order pipeline, that's the goal is to get one um, instruction per cycle. Um, so we can move on and come back if you have questions. Uh, we have a test suite. So this is Jenkins. I don't know if people have used Jenkins for software, but um, what happens is every time we commit to the repository a change to the HDL, um, the, this test suite automatically builds in a number of configurations. We have Berry, we have um, Cherry Micro. This is Cherry is Berry with our memory protection extension. So the, the research effort is really the, that's funded all this is for memory safety, memory protection. So that's why we have a full um, memory virtualization um, setup. So anyway, the, we have a micro version with with swapped up components and removed components, and right now it's not building. Unfortunately, I need to check what's going on with that. Usually we forget some tag and name something that doesn't exist. Then we have uh, Cherry with the FPU. Then we also have Cherry 2, which is the new implementation with a view toward um, formal verification and also um, multi-threading that speed goes. So with every commit, we run a s roughly 2,000 tests that, um, that make sure that our processor runs the full ISA. So to give you a feel for the usefulness of the test suite, we, I developed um, Barry 1 until it could boot FreeBSD, and we generated as many tests as we could at that point. We probably had about 1,000 tests. Now there's 
both almost 2,000 tests. Um, and after we got it to boot free BSD, everything was working, and then we had a new PhD student come in who started to work on uh, Cherry 2, or Berry 2, which was developed, um, started being developed by someone working with us in the States. And he just worked completely in, in simulation and until he could pass the entire test suite, all of those, um, all of the tests there. And then he worked a bit to try to boot FreeBSD in simulation um, with the HDL simulator. And once it was able to get to single user mode, we just thought that afternoon, we thought maybe we should try synthesizing it. He had worked completely in simulation to that point, and we synthesized it. And it um, ran, I think, at 50 megahertz. And we tried to boot FreeBSD, and it worked perfectly. It came all the way up. So it's really, once you have a test suite like this, um, for the hardware. So this was a big job all by itself, but it, it basically makes re-implementing and cleaning things up um, much, much easier to task. And this keeps us, keeps us um, working well. So we're hoping that as we transition to an open source project, which we're trying to do in the next month, this can keep the quality of the implementation high and also allow people to be very creative. So another thing that's helped with is you don't have to be paranoid that you're going to break something that you don't know about because you can do something creative with the branch predictor or the register unit that you want to try out and run the entire test suite and chances are if you if you broke something it's going to show up and so you can uh, we can be a little less conservative about um, adopting things or allowing things in the project. We'll see how it turns out. Could you talk a bit more about the tests that you did? Um, general what kind of tests? Yes. So uh, first of all, there's, um, I think there's about seven, if I remember correctly, around 700 test routines. And then those, all together, there's 2,000 something individual tests in there. And they started with, well, the, the, what they started with is, the, the way they started to be written was, um, originally we didn't have any special tests, but we had the guys downstairs that worked on FreeBSD who were very nervous about starting to work on new hardware and didn't want to waste time with debugging, you know, funny things in the hardware. So they started to write, you know, take very ginger steps to write little tests. So they said, let's write a test for the add instruction and add two things and see if the result comes out. are surprised that actually added two numbers, you know. And then, then what about add unsigned? And so they sort of just go through the manual and made a test for, for every instruction in the, in the spec. And there, some of them they came up with some pretty clever things because they were reading through all the requirements on the manual that it will do this and it won't do that. And so for branches and things, they always they put instructions that happen after the test, after the branch and before the branch, and check at the end that all the instructions that were supposed to happen did happen and didn't were not supposed to happen didn't happen. So we had all those sort of tests. Then, um, then a little more sophisticated was TLB tests where you have to do some sort of translation. Those are not as thorough as they could be, but any trouble that we ran into when trying to boot free BSD, strange cases, and the new things we learned about the ISA, we tried to put those all into tests. So you do have some odd tests in there that were actually cases found in FreeBSD that expose certain corner cases about the, the speed that a TLB entry is, is updated and things like that. And then the FPU, by the time we got there, we had an, another guy, um, Mike, Michael Rowe, working with us, who is a lot more antagonistic when it comes to testing and proving things don't work. And so he, he read the spec and tried everything he could to break the FPU, and he succeeded most of the time. But um, thankfully, every time he came up with a, a new test, you know, he'd come upstairs and say, ha ha, I have a new test that breaks the FPU in some way. And so Colin would be like, oh, no, let me go back and <laughs> fix it. But as a result, um, I think it's all higher quality than, than it, it would have been. When you were talking about not uh, letting the creative people be Say that again? You were, you were talking a bit earlier about letting creative people uh, developing new functions. Yes, yes, stuff. absolutely. 
because of this test without being worried. But don't you think that, so that's good, huh? but uh, don't you think that sometimes a test could fail just because what they created was not respecting the, specific, the original specification? How, how, uh, do you, yeah. how do you think that you could manage that a new function might not be detected as a bug because it's, not, it's new, so it was not in the spec, so cannot pass the test? Um, so you would have to take into account, like for example, if you change the value in a configuration register on purpose, you know, like you said, now the TLD has 300 entries or something like that. That may show up as a failure because it says we were expecting 104 entries and 40 entries, and now you're saying it's 300. Um, so that might happen. But so you would have to parse yourself the the result of those sort of tests. But the kind of things that we catch is if somebody changes how the register file works, and suddenly um, the, for example, branch likely instruction test breaks, it will become very obvious to them. Or if a large number of tests break, you'll know that you broke something. You can go look at the trace. These are all running in simulation, and they produce a full log. So you can go look at that log and figure out what happened that wasn't supposed to happen, and look at the previous ones. Does that, does that make sense? So, I mean, you can make, if you make a new feature, hopefully you're not making a new feature that intends to break the MIPS ISA. Hopefully you're making a new feature that preserves the entire ISA so that it can group things and also does something extra. And you might cause some test that's, like I said, just checking configuration register. Okay, but. but the output of the text, the debug, is, is enough to, to know, oh, that's me who did uh, something that broke totally the, the core, or it's just because it's uh, a small specification of the test that I need to change to what You see the name of the test, mm -hmm. and you see the, val the value that it was expecting, and you see a register, and which value it was expecting in the register, which value it found in the register. So that may or may not be enough for you to know um, what it is you did. Usually, if it's subtle at all, if it's just a configuration registry, you can tell, but if it's subtle at all, um, you'll have to go look at the actual Test and see what Do you have automated um, performance tests so that you can prove that a specific change might improve in speed? We don't have that yet. I, we've talked about doing that, and I'd really like to, especially with the course coming up this year. I'm hoping that um, people can develop, the, the students can develop reduced modules for the micro version. An important thing would be to characterize the performance effect of reducing the complexity of those modules. So we need to do something like that, but we don't yet. The one I have in mind, which is actually too simplistic really, is just dry stone, which is easy to get in the wrong. But um, the trouble is that we're, we're running FreeBSD on, and so a lot of the, uh, the performance impact that that we see is it has to do with TLB effects and things like that that you don't see in micro benchmarks. Um, so it's been slightly less, even even cache effects you don't see unless the benchmark is pretty large. So it's something you need to, maybe we need a separate benchmark for each one. If you're running FreeBSD, you could run spec. Yes, you can. The, the trouble is that you can run spec on FreeBSD, yeah. but our test suite all runs in simulation. And right. so we put, we put a little routine into the ROM in simulation and run the routine. If we booted, I suppose we can, we haven't yet put in the bits to have a FreeBSD image that's already booted and then inject code and then run, which would be ideal to have a some sort of snapshotting mechanism, but we haven't got there yet. Because we've gone back and forth between improving the simulation and improving the um, hardware architecture. And it turns out that with the tracing and hardware, you get a lot of the visibility. You can do, yeah, you can do a lot of the visibility. Most of the visibility in hardware now that you used to be able to do only in software, which we <coughs> did instead. So you can boot up and run spec and trace the whole thing and find out the instructions per cycle. Okay. I think you can just run spec and splash uh, metal, right? You can all the systems here. Or the part in the 
So that's something we need to look into. Yeah. Yeah. So I, think we let, I think this is a great discussion. I think we let John carry on with his talk so we get to the end because we've got about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. okay. And, so, and, but uh, given the next speaker as the yeah, arrive, we'll probably have a bit of a discussion after tea break at this rate. So um, we can carry on. There's plenty of opportunity to discuss later. Yes, okay. So now the next part is um, we have this board that we can take a look at in this tea break. Uh, this it has a touch screen and um, flash and HDMI app, so we can uh, we can plug it into the display projector. So we've done presentations from um, the tablet running FreeBSD on the processor on Barry. Uh, okay, then we have sort of what we call Cherry Cloud, so that people can experiment with the hardware, the instruction extensions that we've done. It's got seven boards. Think seven boards in it, and um, they're all connected with Ethernet to a controller, so you can SSH into the boxes um, remotely. And the goal is to have our compiler that takes advantage of our protection stuff on there, and people remotely can log in and try the new um, features. And is Cherry being open source as well as Berry? Yes, the whole the whole thing with the test suite and the modifications. The, most of the modifications and device drivers for FreeBSD have already been upstream and are set to be included in the next distribution. Um, okay, so then the blue um, Berry is written in blue spec, which is the hardware description language. So I'm going to go through as quickly as possible. Um, right now, one of the biggest caveat with this being an open source project is that blue spec is a commercial tool. Of course, everybody almost uses commercial tools in working with um, with hardware design, so that's not a huge problem, but um, it's not ideal. And of course, David's hopefully working on a new blue spec compiler for us that is open source. But anyway, so just to expose you all quickly to the idea of blue spec. Blue spec, um, other people will tell you other things about blue spec, but I'll give you my impression as someone who doesn't know um, doesn't know, um, you know, much about language theory. Doesn't know functional languages, things like that. BlueSpec to me is um, a hardware description language that is more structured. It it accelerates a good and correct design style, um, making it part of the language, so that you can very easily. Um, build large and correct systems. While, like almost, you know, any language, this this adds structure to the language. It also limits, to some extent, what you can express, or at least makes it more difficult to express more general purpose things. But it also um, makes designs more consistent, um, easier to read, much easier to um, get correct, and easier to modify, which is very important for an open source project. So somebody can come in, step into the middle of a design and um, use, use modules and change modules without uh, breaking them easily. So we'll take a look at, I'll just go straight to an example. Um, this is a FIFO implementation. This one's in Verilog and this one's in BlueSpec. So first of all, you'll see the, the state holding elements are right here at the top, similar to a Verilog module. But the constructor here takes an initial value for the register, zero, false. So, um, the reset signal is implied, it's hidden. It's just up here in the initial values of, um, of the state holding elements. And then we have three interfaces here which are able to update the internal state. Um, uh, you see these interfaces have a type. So this one is an action type. That means that this interface is able to change the internal state. This one is just a value type, which means it can observe the internal state, but it can't update the internal state. By, by making this formal in the language, the um, number one, the designer thinks more clearly about what this interface is meant to do, but number two, it allows machine analysis of the design much better. So even without looking on the inside, you know if something updates the internal state and another one observes the internal state, that you can... Um, run those two operations within a clock cycle, uh, you can simulate them in the opposite direction, right? So you can observe the internal state and then update the internal state and know that you're getting exactly the same result as if you were running in hardware, but you can run it sequentially. 
So that doing this kind of make, forcing you to name things formally and then analyzing and proving it allows simulation to be much, much faster than bare bones. So you're adding a little more structure to the language. Um, another very important thing is that uh, there's a condition here on this interface, what's called a method, if not full. So this is the MQ method. So obviously we know we should not MQ to a FIFO if the FIFO is full, right? So this is allowed to fire if this state element is not full. So you see this actually has a type bool and it can be false or true. If it's not, if not full, in other words, if this, this boolean is um, not is not true, then this is allowed to fire. So then the question is, how is that um, enforced? We're, we're able to say within our module that you cannot exercise that interface. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next one where we use this interface. Um, this, this is kind of a, a bench with two rules. So in blue spec, a rule is, is a um, block of logic that updates the state, and every rule finishes in a clock cycle. So it's very similar to always at positive edge of clock if a number of things, then do this. Um, so this rule doesn't have any conditions. So it should happen every cycle, maybe, except that it uses this MQ interface to this FIFO. So this MQ interface then itself has a condition, right? If I am not, if I am not full, that condition gets lifted up here. So it's not possible to use that interface incorrectly. So if you were using Verilog, you would have to compose your own interface um, to the FIFO saying, I have a full um, flag sticking out. You better check it before you use it. And this is what happens. And with experience and working in a certain company, a certain group of designers will come up with a very strict culture and understand exactly what those interfaces mean. But in an open source context, where you hand that off to other people, what you mean exactly by um, by the full flag or almost full flag can vary. And whether you check that before the clock switches, whether you check it after can be different. But blue spec makes, makes all of this part of the language. So in other words, they, every, every interface has a ready and enable signal that is controlled by your conditions there. Does that make, make sense? So there's, there's kind of a, a protocol for operating between modules built into the language. So whenever you build <coughs> Uh, module, you can add conditions to its interfaces. Where does full ever get set to true? So, um, that's a good question. I wonder if I have a. Uh, ah, I see. I have a, a bug here that I think was noticed the first time I showed this and I never fixed it. So, when you enqueue, this was a good catch. When you enqueue, so the FIFO mem should be set to not only the packet is set, but full should be set, right? So you can't enqueue twice quickly. That makes sense. And then it's set to false if you dequeue, if it is full. And so um, there could be a conflict here, right? Because full is written in two separate rules, except this, or sorry, two separate interfaces or methods, except that this method can only happen if we're not full. This one can only happen if we are full, right? So they're mutually exclusive. Can you have process? Have what? Process with free state, open collector, open drain, the uh, outputs connected to it. Passes? Buses. 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 They do they do have some sort of tri-state thing, but tri-state um, things don't exist in FPGAs, I don't believe, right? Yeah. Not so, internally. Not internally, right. So if you use one in, we're we're mainly working with FPGAs. But they do have tri-state, then they allow you to also import multiple clocks, which we have used and do clock gating and all sorts of things. But um, another example, they, they have wires, which don't have any flow control, for example. So all these registers are either re read or written in an interface, but don't pass between the interface. They have wires, but it just turns out that in the entire Barry design, we haven't needed a wire. Everywhere where we've used a wire, eventually we've replaced it with a register or a FIFO because it was less, it was not, um, it was non-deterministic, more non-deterministic. You weren't, it didn't have any flow control with it. So we've managed to do, well, not just that we've managed, but it's just turned out that we have to require. So I hope that makes sense. So there's types for everything. It's strictly type checks. Um, that, that's the end. Oh, I have, um, in one minute, 
This is the MIPS register file. This is our register file interface. And we have four uh, methods, or four, we can call them interfaces, into the uh, register file. The first one is request registers. This is in the first decode stage, where it simply gives a full report. These are the registers I want to read. This is the register I'm going to modify. It's going to be a pending modification. In other words, I'm going to write and write back. Um, this is the epoch number of my instruction. This is from the debug unit, lots of things. Then we have two methods that have to be called in the same rule, in execute. So I have a note here. So notice, it, it's not able to protect itself to that extent. So there's a little bit extra here. This is read registers and write registers speculative. So read registers happens at the beginning of execute. Write registers speculative happens at the end of execute. And this allows you to have the dependency packed in one, one rule. Um, which happens in one cycle. And finally, write register, which is the canonical write at the end of the register file. And here's an example of the read register um, method in the register file. So you can see it's actually the entire register file um, could fit on two or three of these stream screens, and yet it does register renaming and all sorts of things. Not that easy to understand. Actually, it's greatest. Um, as any register renaming scheme is not that easy to understand, but its, it's greatest virtue is that it's not in the main pipeline. So the main pipeline has a quite simple interface, so people can take advantage of the full throughput of the renaming register file without having to worry about renaming themselves. I'm worried about time. It's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to surround it. Is that a good point to stop? Yeah, Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, there's lots of more discussion to have.